make any discipline that we apply to our kids about them and their improvement in life and not about how upset we might be about something they're doing. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the Jeff Heilman Project. Today is a special episode. We are recording for posterity. Today is our six-year-old's birthday. And so in the spirit of Father's Day having just passed and Juneteenth holiday, which we were able to spend with dear old dad, and also Fourth of July coming up, there's so much to celebrate, so many holidays right now being marked by the remembrance of parenting and fatherhood and motherhood and family that this episode I would like to take the opportunity to dedicate towards the specific attribute of parenting and asking Jeff and having a dialogue around parenting there you can be a single parent you can be a married parent and you can also be a a parent a Hanoi parent a parent of a child who isn't necessarily yours biologically but you've invited them and taken them in Jeff can you explain to us what a Hanoi I hope I'm saying that right I, I, I hope I, we're saying it I right believe, I, I've it's heard Steve Hanoi or Hanai. Refer to it as yep. Hanoi parent. Um, so sometimes parents are not able to get the job parents done just don't understand. by themselves <laughs> yeah parents just don't understand says Will Smith right and so when there are community members of people who know a young person who's typically, you know, let's say 10 to late adolescent age and other members of the community step into that role of being a parent and they just help a little bit. Maybe they share some meals with them or invite them into their home or let them stay the night or in the case of one of our uh, community members, a, a close friend of ours had built a room in his home he remodeled his house he built an extra bedroom and made sure that that uh this friend of ours was able to stay with them because their home life was impacted by just some some and difficult times that's a hanoi about, child um it's hawaiian military. evidently military it, when you grow up on the military base uh someone we were talking to had had been taken in by another military another parent of that's the military right. because you're not just in the military together, your your brothers, your sisters, your you are all related. You are all in this game of life, this walk of life together. And so, I really, th- I I found find it a very soft spot in my heart for the a- aiding of um, fathers and mothers and moms and dads to be able to understand the difference between just par- between fathering or mothering and parenting. Like it, you can. Biologically, we know what has to occur in order to birth a child, but parenting is something completely different than just having children. Parenting <laughs> is, yeah, it's like the wolf pack in the movie with Adam Sandler, the vampire movie, where they get their oh Hotel Transylvania, Hotel Transylvania, <laughs> where they check into the check they check the kids into kitty care on the ship, and they're like, we can do whatever we want. Yeah, like, exactly, you don't get to do anything that you want to do until kids are probably two or three or four years old and you can hire a babysitter Even then you can't i mean it's i see young people or single people partying get you know going to parties going to raves having you know just having a good time tuning out young doing whatever they want tuning out and i'm like oh my god i could not if if we don't if i don't have i've learned in the 27 years of parenting, if I don't have my wits There's about There's a reason me why we don't smoke weed. 2.03 <laughs> we in the morning. We might need to exactly. drive a long distance then to go get one I, of your kids. Uh, yeah, I just, I just know that the second I would let all my guard down, that that's when I would be called upon to need to do something. Yep. So, We're not judging. Nope, We're not just judging. responsible. Not <laughs> we have to be <laughs> just ready to drive to the hospital at 2 in the morning. and effect. Yep. But speaking of understanding cause and effect, this a few minutes ago a, a few a little while ago I was going through our library because you know, I said you know I really want to read from a book today on mm. today's episode and and I want to find something that I can read that we could talk about and this it was fast I was looking through all of our books I'm like yeah I, you know these are all really good books 
But then I came to a book that I totally, absolutely love, being an entrepreneur as I am, as you are. She's going to surprise by, me. By um, um, Tom Peters, The oh, yeah. Circle of Innovation. Circle of Innovation. Which you would yeah. say, well, how does the Circle of Innovation have anything to do or correlate with parenting? Oh, well, I think that that's, they're actually very book. closely related. If you're in management or if you're in leadership, if you are in a job role where you have anyone that answers to you, you are a parent. Let's face it, you are you are a parent. But in this book, and and it was interesting because I have it. I haven't picked up this book in probably years. I've read it completely, but I haven't picked it up. And I'm seeing anybody on the video can probably see that I have it marked right here. And I'm going to for those of you who are just listening to our audio podcast, welcome. We have video drops on Tuesdays, uh, the following Tuesday from Friday. And so if you want to watch us on YouTube and go like and subscribe, we're already at over 50 subscribers. 50. Woo. Woo Another record for posterity today. And this episode, I think we're at 51. But that's right. And that's pretty, pretty good growth considering we haven't been doing any. And the shorts are doing well. Which advertising is amazing. or anything. So, yeah. So awesome, guys. Thanks for, sh thanks for spreading the word. I'm holding in my hand the book without the jacket because all of our books seem to lose their jackets over time if we've read them by Tom Peters called The Circle of Innovation. What year did he? Could you maybe while I'm looking for the year, could you tell us a little about Tom Peters who he who he was? Tom Peters is a he's a writer, he is a consultant, a speaker and really made his mark um, in the mid 80s as a follow-on to Peter Drucker talking about best practices. Um, there's a DVD. If any of you have an extra 50 bucks and you want to get an insane uh, drill down talk, there's a, there's a DVD of a talk by Tom Peters called, um, let's see if I can find the name of it and put it in the, uh, um, but it, it had something to do with, um, it wasn't Circle of Innovation. It was a follow on to this. Um, it was something about uh, the disruptive age. Uh, and he talked about just marketing and trends and what is brilliant talk that is uh, very current, even though it's, um, you know, well, probably 10 years old. Well, that seems to be his whole spiel is, is what's cutting edge, what's Yeah, what's what, what are people doing? What I are mean, people doing? as a writer myself, if you've ever picked up the Circle of Innovation, which was written in 1997, uh, you see, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you can't do that. I mean, he's got like entire pages of... That are one sentence. You know, one sentence, capital letters in the middle, in the middle of a paragraph in order to make a point. And it's just formatted extremely different and interesting. And this is way before, um, way before social media and TikTokers yeah. started yeah. coming out with books like short this. attention span, short attention span books. So, so here's what I wanted to read. Oh, you had it. It was marked. marked. Okay. And I'm like, well, why is it maybe? So, I'm going through, and I'm like, okay, there's the book. We're talking about I parenting here now, Jessica. Oh, I know. <laughs> And so this this is where I had it marked, and I'm like, this, I I guess this is where I get my project concepts because everything to me is a project. Like I am so project focused. All of our kids through homeschooling. She's making bunk beds today, folks. Maybe she'll post some of those photos. <laughs> All of our kids through homeschooling have been a project, and I've just been geared like it, every. It's a project, project, project. So this this goes right into it. So here we are on page two o seven. And it's number six. It says, okay, so we're talk he's talking about turning every job into a project. And he says in number seven, score quantitatively every project on excitement, urgency, and transformation potential. So first off, he's saying turn everything into a project. And then he's going on top of that saying don't just turn it into a project. Score it based on its excitement urgency, and transformation potential. Work hand in glove with your clients up to the excitement score, the urgency score, and the project's transformation potential score. Never allow project work to become root work. I was blessed early in my McKinsey sojourn with a senior partner, Alan Puckett, who had the ability to turn the silliest damn task into a Harrison Ford-like quest for the Holy Grail. He kept his young consultants perpetually turned on and 
always delivered unique value to even his most humdrum clients. And then in the, the notes on the side, I wrote, no task is small when it is seen as a project. So the reason why I brought that up in regards to parenting is I loved how he has so eloquently said that when you turn something into a project, number one, no task is too small. So making the bed becomes an amazing addition to your life. Because it is a project. And it is. I love making him the and better. And then, every morning. I don't secondly, know why. he wow. says he keeps his young, this, this person, um, Puckett, kept his young consultants perpetually turned on, always delivering unique value to even the most humdrum clients because every single task was important. Every single task was a project, and he was able to keep them engaged and enticed with life based upon the sense of excitement, urgency, and projects transformation potential. Now, the number one problem or the number one thing that I get presented with with being a parent, especially a parent of teen and parenting, is how do I get my son or daughter ambitious? How do I get them to be ambitious? How do I Why get do you them think that to is? get up Why? off of the couch? Why do you think that is like the I number one question? I honestly think that this one paragraph... From Tom Peters' book written in 1997 about how to deal with with your clients and how to deal with the people in your organization is that parents are not translating to their children what an important impact even mundane little tasks and how fun and what a what a project. If you can see something, well, you're you're always telling me what does done look like. We talked about it on the podcast earlier. What does done look like? So with your with my bend towards projects and project management and just really loving to be able to see a project pro, you know, project plan the podcast room, project plan the bunk beds that I made today. I'm constantly working on seeing something from start to finish. Having an in picture, being able to go through the whole creative process, what needs to happen. So, so I've treated my days turning each little task into a project and saying, okay, the project to clean the di do the dishes. This is a project, and it's going to go from dirty sink to clean sink, and that's the completion of a project. And so we have all we win stack or clean sink throughout to the dirty day. Dirty sink if you're cooking something exciting, right? And we win stack, like you like to talk about, win stack throughout the entire day, a bunch of these little projects, turning each one into, like, what's the transformation? Like, what's going to, what do we get? What do we get at the end of this little project? Yeah. And so I don't, you know, it's one thing to harp on your children and be like, take out the trash, take out the trash, or go clean the car, go wash the car. And it's another thing to turn it into a project. We happen to have five sons. And a big part of managing my older sons has been competition. Like, let's, how can we turn this into a game? How can we take this thing that we don't want to do? I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to go pick up poop in the backyard. But how many pieces can you get? How long can, can you do it faster? I remember when they were little and we would have some, you know, bomb of a, you know, we used to call Monday mornings, daddy's been home from the weekend, clean up, clean up, clean up, clean after, up after daddy's, daddy's been, been home, home for the, for the weekend, weekend day, because we would just like all, all, you know, let, let it, go. it go all weekend yeah. because we're playing with dad, we're playing with each other and it would be cleanup day. And I would set a timer on any clock and I'd say, okay, we're going to go do this room and we're going to give it 10 minutes. And we're going to get it. We're going to see what we can do in 10 minutes. If, see how close we can get to done in 10 minutes. Was it, do we know what done looks like? Yeah, it's a clean room all the way through. How much time do we have? 10 minutes. Here's a timer. And it was like an egg timer, so you could hear it. Tick, 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 yep. tick, tick. And we're working. But it's a project, and we're completing it. And it's fun because we actually are, number one, we're doing it together. Two, no task is too small when it's seen as a project. Three, it's a clear deliverable, which is clean, and this is project it's time. It's urgent if you timer. And it's urgent with the timer, and we're focused. And so yeah. we go throughout our day being focused on these projects. And I find that people who have allowed their children to, number one, not get engaged. Number two, they don't make it fun. You know, sometimes our... Yeah. Fun is we get to go get, we, what else did we used to do? We used to reward evasion, like we talked about with Michelle Trail a couple episodes back. We, I would tell the kids we're going to go to McDonald's and we're going to go get a sundae. We're going to go get a hot fudge sundae. 
but we got to do this first. Once we do this, we're going to get a hot fudge sundae. Let's see how fast we can do that, you know, or otter pops or, you know, whatever it is. And so we've never seemed to have a big problem with our kids having ambition issues because I think that we consistently recognize that there is work that needs to be done and that work can be fun and it can be viewed as a project. What do you, what do you think? Do you, do you find the question continuously about apathetic, ap apathetic Americans or apathetic teenagers? And then when you look at our own family and how we've decided to motivate by way of projects and reward. You and I have always talked about what do we want it to look like? Yeah. We always start with the vision. And sometimes we have a hard time finding a vision. There have been times when I've gone through job changes and I didn't know what to do or didn't know what my next move was going to be. There have been times when we weren't sure what the house situation was going to be to be able to take care of the size of the kids or um, what we're going to do with cars. Like we've had, we've had to upgrade our cars <laughs> multiple yeah. times. because Finding cars has been a project. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we, we looked for a year for that Suburban um, to, find a, to find a Suburban that we could comfortably afford to write a check for where there was nine seats. Yeah, and had to have a bench in the front. We didn't want to buy a brand new one, right? We wanted to buy a used one. So um, we always start with the vision, and then we look at, um, I, was, I, was, I had chat GPT go through and answer the question, uh, number one, what does childhood trauma have to do with procrastination? And it answered that uh, quite a bit of research is behind procrastination being tied to pain avoidance based on childhood trauma. And then the second thing was, what are the top three things you can do to take care of procrastination? And I thought this was interesting, getting back to, mm -hmm. to you know dreams, which is um, number one is to um, break it down into bite-sized pieces, whatever the thing is, right? Um, number two was to mechanize and put routines in place to say you're going to brush your teeth every night before you go to bed, or you're going to have you're going to start work at eight and be done by easy deliverables, four. easy like consistent deliverables, check boxes, and then the the third one was uh, I'm sure it'll come to me, but but those those big two break it down into bite-sized pieces and then time box right use time boxing. Yeah. Um, I think when we are trying to get something done with the kids, a lot of times, I've seen you set that timer so many times, <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we're going to go hard for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and then you're done. Yeah. And it breaks it down. And then by the time you get to 15 minutes, it's like you're so close to being completely finished that a lot of times it'll carry, the momentum will carry into 20 or 25 minutes to get the job done. The other thing, too, with regard to ambition for the kids is help them do what they wanted to do. We yeah. found something that they would be interested in. Jeffrey yeah. was really interested in Chopped. He watched Chopped every day, five days a week, over and over and over Guilty. and over. Guilty. Yep, we did. <laughs> really loved it. And then we got him an apprenticeship at a restaurant where he actually ended up learning how to make desserts. Mm -hmm. And then he taught a celebrity that we knew that was going on the show uh, how to make a dessert in 20 minutes. Yep. And this person won their episode of Chopped with the dessert that Jeffrey showed him how to make. And then... Jeffrey got a signed apron from all the judges because of this celebrity got it for him as a thank you. Uh, and then he used that in his promo video on Twitter, tagged Ted Allen and got on the show himself. So to me, if you're doing something that's exciting, this goes back to what you were talking about, doing something that's exciting, doing something that has transformational ability. Being on that TV show in New York City transformed his belief and his ability to be in food and to run restaurants. No question about it. And the urgency uh, was, you know, once they gave us a date, we had to get our butts out to uh, New York City and go film the show. So um, I think that Tom Peters' example is absolutely right on in what we're doing. And he says here, he says, put together a current projects list or a CPL, post it prominently, carry it around with you, obsess about it, because your current projects list equals you. Y-O-U. So think about that for a minute. Whatever project you have going on, whatever project you have in the queue, if your project is, is, if your project is to complete your tax, made it for the week again If today. your project is to work on your taxes, you are a person working on their taxes. What you do. If your project yeah. is get the taxes done, you are getting your taxes done. 
So yep. if you can just think about like whatever current projects you have in your mainframe, in your database, whatever current projects are, you know, rolling around in your mind, you're either going to be the type of person who has a mind full of pr incomplete projects or you're going to be the type of person who gets your projects done because your projects are you. And your projects are you, you are your projects. And so I find it interesting that you were reading an article based on childhood trauma and procrastination. I find that that is, uh, like you said, it was avoidance. And, and when you have trauma associated, even whether it's through a, you know, uber a situation where you grew up and your household was super uber religious and so to avoid the pain of religion you don't go to church anymore you don't go and you don't practice your faith or you say you're going to but you never do that that type of pre you're you're avoiding you're procrastinating you're avoiding if there's money a lot of times the kids kids either grow up affluent and they end up associating pain and so they become procrastinators when it comes to paying their bills or doing things on time because they are avoiding the pain associated with how they were treated and how money how money was viewed in their house or lack there's that that's another big one where if you grew up and there wasn't much in the house or there was a there was a poverty mentality to where you know there was never going to be enough and we were always going to run out well then the procrastination to I mean why succeed what's the point you know you you don't want to get up and go to you 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 go late to your not you by the way the metaphorical you would end up being late to work they go and they go and get a job and they're late every morning because they're procrastinating why are they procrastinating well why would they even work hard because there's not going to be enough anyway so so much of this apathy this procrastination this lack of ambition can be stemmed to some form of a traumatic situation or some po form of an overbearing person who is trying to parent but maybe didn't understand didn't know how to incorporate like you said love and really hearing what the child has to say about their interests and the things that they'd like to do instead of the things that you think are what's best for them yeah and if we look at discipline I was talking about this to a friend a couple of weeks ago. We're disciplining the kids, right? All kinds of jokes and memes and stuff about kids taking beatings, and uh, we, we are not in favor of that, for the record, <laughs> mindlessly beating, beating somebody's kid. Um, but I think the rule of thumb is, which, by the way, pun intended, the rule of thumb has to do with the uh, size of the stick that someone is to beat their children with should not be any bigger around than their thumb. That's where that phrase come from. Wow. Um, I learned something new. You know, I, <laughs> uh, keep it smaller than, than your thumb. And personally, like, I'm fine with just hey, wait, your hand. Smaller than your thumb would hurt more than the... It depends on how whippy well, it is. Yeah, it's but either it's not whippy be bone or... Bone crushing, yeah, like right. baseball no, bats, that's right? That's true. That's true. No, we don't. Um, and, and, we are not advocating, we're, we're not for, advocating for beating your children. I'm simply saying, here. Uh, personally, it's, it's the a hand. It's statement. The whole if I'm the swatting, whole statement. If I'm swatting my kid, you know, I don't use anything We haven't even hand. had to spank a kid in a decade. Can't even, Over a decade. I don't, I don't know if that's because we got... I think the we big ones take care of it. Maybe we became yeah. better parents as we Better got negotiators. Older. We don't have to use brute force. <laughs> exactly. But, but the, We've the, been uh, studying psychology for so long. Yeah. How to get Johnny to behave without beating Johnny. I do think that it deserves being addressed. The key issue in the discipline can never be how pissed off the parent is. It has to be what is right for the child. Which is, and You're I think You're correcting that a child. You're bringing a child up to a standard of behavior. You're not belittling yourself because of anger and offense through compromise. And, thinking. you know, 27 years ago, if you would have asked me about spanking kids and i would have immediately been absolutely um, yep, he who spares the, he who spares the rod spoils the child and all for spanking but then now that i am 27 year vet veteran uh, and having children not just had my oldest and sorry to my older children that i'm coming to this revelation later on in my life but and having young ones now it's not necessary i i 
I, I disagree. Haven't, I haven't found it's good. It's we not can an absolute. Disagree. It's not an absolute. I, there are okay, times when. So my my physical and, and, punishment in is a all requirement. fairness. In all fairness, we've you know if we have had to have a spanking situation, a lot of times it does come down to dad and doing that. And I'm not for it or against it. I'm my point being is this is that I used to my my parameter for spanking justly was if I tell you no, don't do that. And you deliberately disobey me. Don't touch that cookie. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. Oof. But then you look out of the corner of your eye and you take that thing. Then absolutely, <laughs> there would have been a physical spanking. Only hand to bottom. Nothing. Nothing more than that. Yep. And even we had some really good friends show us how to do it to where you just kind of scoop them under their bum and they they take fall the wind the out of them. Yeah, just kind of. Didn't I just kind of. I mean, you take the wind yeah, out of them because yeah. they're not you expecting to be not expect. taken off their feet. But I don't do that anymore. I don't. I don't even spank my kids anymore because, for one, I'm not as I'm not as freaked out about touching cookies. Like, like it used <laughs> like you know what I mean. Like, like well, you can't deliberately kids, disobey me the, when oh. getting a cookie because I don't really care. Like, like <laughs> things like that aren't the, the older kids keep the younger kids in it, line. It's, That's it's a like huge factor. My maturity in being a forty-something-year-old parent versus a twenty. It's so uh, you're much picking your battles. So much used to bother me as a young parent that does not bother me now. That what I'm looking for more than a, like. Okay, honestly, I probably was looking for wait reasons to correct them. Like, oh, I need to find a reason to correct my kid because I'm scared of my kid ending up being a turkey, being being a yep. being a being a you know unmarried teen, pregnant teen, or whatever. So I'm scared of that. So I'm gonna be super uber like on them helicopter parent. Yep. But now it's so much more about gosh, if I can just find out what they love, what they're interested in, yep. they like don't Andrew. even they don't even try to do naughty things because they're having such a freaking great life i want i i look over at you yeah, all the they time don't want to disappoint and us i and say i look over at you all the time and i say can i be one of our kids like legit like can i be our kid because they have got so much opportunity and they've got so much like when you're raised to believe that you can have have what's whatever you say out of your mouth, when you believe that when you're raised to believe that you've got a high self image, that you're that you can, you know, that that the answer isn't no forever. It's just not right now. When you when you've learned that and can teach that, like our kids, they know out of respect when to ask and when they have to work for it. Like for example, if it's something super expensive, they know when they can ask us to buy it for them, and they know when, oh, no, there's a line, and if this thing that I really want, I'm going to work for it. I'm going to earn it. I'm going to do something in order to contribute because this is a big ask. So they understand what big asks are. Right. And and I'm not going to be on them about crossing all their T's and dotting all their I's, and are they, you know, are they perfect like I would have been, and and I think that it was part of the militant desire to raise yeah, a perfected there's certainly child some that concern. led me more towards th you know thinking that a lot of occasions with little ones are justified, j like are spanking justified, and I've just that's what I mean why I'm saying like it's unnes. It seems like it's become unnecessary because so much effort has been raised has been we've put into our children over the gen through the through you know pancake one pancake two pancake three that by pancake seven our pancakes are getting nice and fluffy and golden it's simply because i feel like we've put so much love jeffrey's and the best attention. first pancake ever best first jeffrey, case ever jeffrey jeffrey turned out great i mean it was a great pancake. recipe to start and it's and it was a great recipe to start. And I love the first the first pancake because it's got the it's got the oil and it's a little crunchy, it's a little crispy. Yep. But they've just gotten fluffier and more golden over time. And I think it's because we have just gone from being like super like okay, this parents. is the way that it's got to be, and dot 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 dot, dot to okay. Like, let's, let's see how this circle of innovation, let's continue to try out this trial and error process of innovating with each child, growing with each child, becoming new parents with every child. 
And if you've got a challenge with parenting or if you're looking to having more than one children, we always encourage people. What do you say? The first is the hardest. Yeah, people ask us all the time, like, oh, my God, how do you deal with seven kids? And I tell them, oh, my God, how do you do it with one? <laughs> because when you have one kid, you are their entire world. If they're hungry, you have to feed them. If they're sleepy, you have to put them to bed. If they want to wake up, you have to get out of bed. You have no life with one kid. But when you have two kids or three kids, the older ones start to help, and they run interference for you, and you can have the older kids say, if they put anything in their mouth, take it out. Or bang on the door because I'm going to go take a shower for 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, and you can, even the babysitters, the babysitters charge per kid. But when we had one kid, I was like, I'm tipping her extra because I know how much work they are to, yeah. to take care of. So at this point, with the last probably four kids, I haven't done anything. I feel like I have not done any <laughs> child raising at all in 15 years since Washington was born. As a matter of fact, I've, I've thought about that more often than not. Like, man, I was so light. I was so thin when I had like one kid. And then by the time I had some, like, I don't even have to walk to do anything anymore. You know, no wonder I got fat. Like, hey, yeah, hey, kid. Uh, yeah. Go get me a beer. Get a glass of water. Open it and bring me a cold <laughs> mug <laughs> out of the freezer. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, you really got to watch that. You really got to, you know, you got to set the example. That's another part of why, you know, the next generation might not be as ambitious is are you setting the example of being ambitious? Are you creating projects? Are you completing projects? I mean, nothing does me better. Nothing does my heart better than to be in the middle of a project, sweating it out, working it out, building something and having my kids see me doing it, and then either they're gonna feel like, man, I should, I should come and help do it, or they're gonna, they're gonna know their mom is somebody who does projects, and that they can do projects, or they're gonna feel that little guilt, guilt, twi guilt twinge when they go back to doing what they were doing, and be like, oh, I, I could be helping mom, but I'm not, but. I have to be the one doing the project first. Like I'm going to, we're going to, we as parents and part of parenting is setting the bar, setting the stage, building the stage for success that they see us doing things. They see us out there doing projects, starting projects. And they want to help and get being involved. in the middle. And then another big part of us parenting and our parenting style uh, thankfully, the homeschooling, the unschooling really facilitated that. But even I think if you didn't and your kids were in traditional schooling, there are so many things that you could do on the weekends together. We take our kids every everywhere with us. If you had an opportunity to go on a sales trip and get a room somewhere because your company was paying for the room, I mean, we'd pile in, we'd pile all of us in that car and we'd go, daddy's going to Sacramento and we'd go and get a couple bunk beds and go use the pool and just be with you. And, and you'd go out on your sales call during the day and we'd kick it in the hotel that the company was paying for and we'd go to the pool. And we weren't interfering with your ability to do your job, but there's no reason why we couldn't have gone with you. There's no reason why we shouldn't go with you because the kids get the drive time together. We get to You've been stay at home mom for together. 25 of the last 27 the years. Together. So it's, it's an awesome opportunity. I know that we actually have friends who have, you know, taken jobs overseas into different countries and then, like, got their kids exposed to your buddy Justin, took his kids to Bali, and that wasn't necessarily work-related, but it was like, hey, I've got young kids and we want to try something yeah. for, a, for a period of time. And so children, we grew up in a time when we were kind of all coming out of that, our children are to be seen, not heard, you know, that. Yeah, you and I were racing kind of the tail end of that. We were kind of the tail end. It, I mean, it was still it was still a part of our generation because that's like how my mother was raised. Yep. And so she, my mother as well. she had to kind of overcome that. And really, she they, they both of our moms kind of tended to go kind of complete. They wanted to go 180. It was a culture change for no, them to... You know, no rules, no responsibilities, no requirements. But that, for me, was like, no, it, there's got to be a happy medium. There's got to be a medium between between having zero expectations of your children and too harsh of expectations. What do you think that that medium is? I think that balance is a back and forth rhythm. It's not a static 
position because if somebody stands with both feet perfectly balanced, they don't go anywhere. They're not moving. But mm -hmm. balance in and of itself is the the yin and yang back and forth across a center line that allows you to stay on a surfboard or a bicycle or to walk and move forward. So I think that certainly we want to try to be consistent with regard to discipline, but I think we were pretty hard on our kids in the first couple of years, and I think we're pretty easy on them right now. And I think that there's a macro curve over a 27-year period that says we've kind of flip-flopped from super, super uber critical and heavier on the discipline to much more relaxed. But there was also back and forths along the way. There were times when we were easier and harder on Jeffrey, easier and harder on Joe, easier and harder on Madeline. And then as we moved in the macro toward a softening of it, you kind of get this middle group of the kids, Madeline, Andrew, Osh, and Teddy, um, who are in that middle section from birth order, who they got to see us change. Yeah. Versus Jeff and Joe were like, you guys well, get even, let these guys get away with murder. Even Madeline, our number three, is like, oh my gosh, when I was a kid... <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten away with that. You know, I like, wouldn't have got away with that. Yeah, that's what she I, says. There was a it's Father's Day. I was listening to a message on the radio about fathers on Father's Day, of course, and he was talking about to dads, and he was talking about you know being able to. S there were like three things, but one of them was being able to you know ask you be a dad who can say they're sorry, be a dad who can mm. ask for forgiveness, and I know that we have sat down with our 20 somethings yeah. now and said, Hey man, you know, I really blew it when I was a kid, when you were, when you were younger or, you know, I, I'm really proud of who you've become. And, and it was not because we were horrible parents that you've become, you know, you've overcome us. It was more like the relationship has transformed from being father, son to, fr you know, almost friends, but not, you're not, yeah, you're still not peers. You're, we're just, we're just like Madeline's my best friend. She's one of my best friends. She's 20 years old and she's a uh, good. Our relationship has definitely grown to where we can be open and talk about all kinds of stuff. Yep. And we wouldn't have been able to do that when she was little. And so being a dad who can say that you're sorry and being a, being a mom who can ask for forgiveness and be like, dude, I was out of line. I'm, you know, that was, that was me being tired or something yeah, like that. Somehow we're compromised in our judgment. And I think that recognizing, and psycho cybernetics is such a great read, just helped so much to understand that, that we have the ability to condition ourselves to automatically deal from a position of fact instead of fiction, fact instead of opinion, actual circumstance versus magnified obstacles so that our actions and reactions will be based on truth, not your own or others' opinions or compromised states of being. Like that's that's the charter for a plus plus parent is to be able to lead and guide your children by first following your own dream and path. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing for us, Getting Jessica some of and your I. Projects on your project, yeah, Jessica, your bucket list. Jessica and I have gone through. I mean, I crossed everything off my bucket list by the time I was forty. I had to make a second bucket list, mm -hmm. and I don't say that to to brag as much as to say that. We had never stopped going after what we wanted out of our lives. And as a result, it gave us permission to expect our children to go after what they wanted. to do. And I think that when you were talking about balance and, and, and going, going hard or easy, and, or it's a, I found that as a, as a parent is going to, like we were talking, we were joking, but parenting is taking your full attention a hundred percent of the time and if you're not able to give a hundred percent of your energy to being a parent even if that means you're in an away vacation and it's two o'clock in the morning and you get a phone call because somebody's been in a car accident you just you know you the being present is parenting parenting is being, being present. present for your kids listening is I, i've noticed whenever i can when, whenever we're in the house and if i hear a or a or a oh, like a, a, right I my ear goes that's not you know that that doesn't, fit, that the doesn't standard. fit the normal sounds of the house somebody's irritated then i'll immediately do one of two things i'll i'll look and i'll think 
well, have we been working? Is this like, have we been is it stress is induced? It, is it hard or is it lay? Have we been laying around? Because it seems one of those two things. They get snippy with each other when either they've been working too hard or not enough. Or not enough. And that's where I was talking about the rhythm of exactly. balance. Exactly. And that's right? when if you I haven't been working hard enough, you crack the exactly. whip and you say, all right, gotta, we're going okay. for a walk. You're doing yeah. the dishes. Time we're cleaning to get up. up the. Living room, it's Monday after dad's been home for the weekend day, time to get going. And and I can tell. But it's not always that way. Sometimes they're just tired from working. And then, and that's, and works. you have to recognize is this, is this whine or is this complaint? Is this needling of each other a result of working too hard and it's time to kick our feet up and go watch a movie and eat some birthday cake and go get some ice cream? Or is this a result of not working hard enough and then it's time to, okay, let's get up, let's, clean something let's sweep something when was the last time the cat box has been changed and it's doing that day in and day out which is why being 100 percent present as a parent is so critical and so vital because you really have to be taking the temperature of the house consistently i mean you know because of the way that we do it that if you even walk by a child in the hallway and they you know either look away or aren't you know if they don't respond they never would. They never would. We're just, we just got them so yeah. conditioned that, that, that high fives in the hallway is we're going to acknowledge each other. There's going to be a you know, so tossling of the hair. So my question then is, so are we, lo- what, are we just looking for an ideal state all the time? And like, what's the... Yeah, my buddy Chris Doris talks about this all the time. You can absolutely be in the all-in state. All the time. Is all in happy? Is that like... All uh, in is is it's declaring what you want. Let's um, see if I can remember Chris Doris on the fly here. It's declaring what you want, which is clarifying. It's... Um, or deciding what you want. Side is clarity. It's declaring what you want, which is to confess. And then it's do what it takes, D-W-I-T, which is to commit. That is the all-in state. When you decide what you want, declare what it is that you want as if it already was, do whatever it takes. You get clarity, confirmation, and commitment toward toward a thing. That's the all-in state. It is it, when now you, for when me, you my actually jump state, off the waterfall, I you are committed. To, I have to drill it down to the scripture that says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If I yeah. don't have joy, I feel weak. And so when... I think that in the past, when people have come to me and they've been down or depressed or negative and they can't understand why I'm always trying to flip it around, like, let's get, like, let's get happy, let's be happy, and they they don't really understand, well, why can't I just be feeling the feels? Because a big part of being happy is, can tend to, can come across to others as looking like, well, they don't ever feel the feels. They don't ever feel the feelings. When the truth is, I'm a very emotional person. I've got deep, deep feelings and high emotions. And I have found myself under the duress, my baseline MO of the all in state for me to be cleansed and is happy joy and up and because joyful. the joy of the Lord is my strength in that I feel weak if I'm not if I do not have joy. That's right. And so it's very difficult for me to be in the presence of other people who believe like I believe or say that they are a believer and don't have joy because either they haven't been, they ha- they don't take they don't take it to mean the same that I take it to mean or they maybe just haven't quite gotten the education or gotten the renewing of their mind enough to recognize that our strength comes from our joy, and our joy is is just it's a it's a state of being all in to me. It's a state of being at worship. It's a state of being happy. It's a state of being grateful. It's just like great. Like how can you? No task is small when it is seen as a project. Like how can you yep. be unhappy taking out the garbage when the if project? You if you just break it down, yeah. and the, the 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 how. My favorite day is Wednesday. Speaking of which, it's Wednesday. We need to take the trash out tonight. My favorite day is Thursday morning because I've got empty trash cans. Like, we want during Christmas to give our garbage men bonuses because the we, uh, can you just imagine I wasn't it Rich DeVos talking about I think in Selling America or something about the garbage man and if all the if all the garbage men stopped coming 
one day what a state that this place would be, what a problem we would have. Like, no, your gar, you need to be good to your garbage men. Like, we need to be grateful and thankful. And if we're grateful and thankful on a daily basis with even just the littlest tasks and recognizing that that strength and that all-in state, which is why we have the thermometer for the house, which is why in our parenting style, if we hear something off, we immediately go to, oh, it must be time for a family vacation. Or, yeah. oh, or it must rest, be time to or a book go rake at the, the library. Or something. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And that's that's the one thing that I was going to say as far as rest and recovery how do you stay in that all-in state with the energy that it takes to burn you go heavy on rest mm-hmm. you recover spiritually through meditating in whatever scriptures or or uh, verbiage elevates your spirit you rest physically toggle back and forth between exertion and exercise and rest today was my off day i lifted yesterday i'm off today and then i lift again tomorrow so you're toggling back and forth, and you create that rhythm of uh, rest and exertion. You rest mentally by recharging, reading good books or watching a, a good, you know, exciting documentary. I'm in episode six right now, the Ken Burns documentary on jazz that we're watching through PBS on uh, Amazon Prime. And making eating an event, eating as an event, as I a mean, we, fellowship and feast today. Let's talk about the food that we had today. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. You cooked me yes, I did. omelet with mm-hmm. onions and rice and some type of olive turkey paste, turkey and bacon and, and coffee. Mushrooms. That was for this morning. <laughs> and I was present for the entire meal. It was fantastic. Yeah. And then we did uh, Chick-fil-A for lunch. And I was not present for that. I scarfed that down as fast <laughs> as I possibly could. Hey, we're, we're, but you made it an event because you took Madeline with Because you. I took Madeline, exactly. And then and we bonded. made it. And then we, for Madeline, for uh, Nessie's birthday today, we went to McDonald's. And Brought we got it our, home and sat at the table. Our burgers and we sat at the table. An and that was an event. And we were present for that. And um, not that we have to keep eating all meals out or that we're sponsored by any of these fast food places. We're not. But if you recover spiritually by reading and meditating in prayer to whatever God you believe in and serve. If you recover physically by alternating physical rest, meditation, deep breathing exercises, stretching, yoga, and sleep, juxtaposed against weightlifting and cardio for exertion. If you rest mentally by reading and putting good stuff in your head, and if you rest and gain energy emotionally by spending time with people you love people that make you laugh um, we had a wedding this last weekend and it was an incredible venue we were with people that made us laugh the entire time we were just screaming laughing for hours and hours on thursday friday saturday um, that was a very restorative and powerful emotional yeah. way of recovery if you do that And you understand the ability for you to decide what it is that you want, declare and confess what it is that you're going to go after, and then DWIT, do whatever it takes. Get yourself committed to taking massive action by settling down, slowing down, breaking it down, and buckling down. Then you're going to live a different kind of life. And that's what this podcast is all about. We want you to have access to a different set of tools than you're used to having. Tony Robbins talks about the the secret of success or the science of success, science of achievement, and that it's basically you figure out what it is that you want, start taking massive action toward it, you make adjustments along the way, and then you keep going until you get your outcome. That's the science. If you do those four things, you're going to get progress in your dreams. But um, as you'll see with many people that are $50 million, $100 million net worth, billionaires, if they don't get the relationships in their life right, the love, gratefulness, the gratitude, the understanding that we're all here for a really short period of time and that you can decide to be in a grateful state, which is your key to the uh, art of fulfillment, is to simply decide that you're going to live in a grateful state and then back it up by deciding what it is that you want, declaring what it is that you want, being willing to do whatever it takes, and recognizing that part of doing whatever it takes is to recover in the areas of spiritual, mental, emotional, and uh, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. Um, by toggling and pushing waves of recovery into your nervous system to offset the waves of exertion. And what are the waves of exertion? Let's just look at that for a second. Physically, if you're physically doing work or paying attention to something for a job, 
doing activities, that is going to deplete you physically. Mm -hmm. Mentally, if you're focusing, if you're talking, if you're doing your job in the knowledge worker space, that can be mentally exhausting. So that's exertion of physical, exertion of exhaustion, exertion of uh, mental. The third, spiritual. If you have faith and you're trying to close a deal, build a house, do a project, hire a staff, have a baby, <laughs> have a baby that is spiritually ex spiritual exertion and it needs spiritual recovery. And then the emotional side of it, which is anything social. If you're dealing with people, if you're wiping their noses and wiping their diapers and cleaning up their poo-poo because they're just having a bad day because that's what people who are stressed out of their minds at work typically do. It's what leaders spend a lot of time doing is wiping people's butts is, uh, mm -hmm. is the closest way that I can describe it. You know, that requires an emotional, that's when I call my friends where I can take my armor off and not have to be the badass at work, just dealing with constant whining and crying of people that are wetting themselves and just complaining and customers do it. Employees do it. I probably do it too. But if you're dealing with people who are whining, you need some emotional recovery time where you can go behind closed doors and drink a beer with a buddy, smoke a cigar, spend time with your family and make that emotional recharge um, possible too. So that's, that's when we do that, it makes it a lot easier to parent and to be able to control ourselves and discipline ourselves first to make any discipline that we apply to our kids about them and their improvement in life and not about how upset we might be about something they're doing. So as we, as we end, I think that this is the perfect number nine here in the book is this perfect yeah, please ending. Read it. And it says nine, do whatever it takes. Mm. Projects are about outcomes, about getting things done. The project team is the heart and soul of the professional service organization. So I read that as the project family, the, the family that looks at raising children and parenting as projects is the heart and soul of the professional service organization. It is the heart and soul of America. It is the heart and soul of the community that you're living in. And trust me, a lifelong professional service denizen is everyone's sacred duty to help out a project team that's in a crunch take what you're doing take what you're learning go help others period i call this a rush to the scene of the crime culture gary withers chief of the brilliant marketing services firm imagination has made this a mainstay of his organization he encourages no demands individualism and entrepreneurship yet no one i've met is as zealous about nurturing a rush to the scene of the crime culture nobody starting with withers is too senior to run the copy machine or get coffee at 2 a.m when a project team needs help and if the team screwed up big time doesn't matter who doesn't screw up regularly i repeat it's your sacred duty to help other teams in a crunch, no matter how damn busy you are. And that is exactly. Yeah. Um, Seth Godin says it this way. The call to action for us to be linchpins in our organization. Are you indispensable? He wrote a book on it called Linchpin. Are you indispensable? If you look at all this stuff going on with ChatGPT and ChatGPT4 and AI, and they're talking about all the jobs that are going to get replaced, man, your job's not going to get replaced as long as you're indispensable. That's right. And how do we become indispensable? By rushing to the scene of the crime. By rushing to the scene of the how crime. How many people run the other direction and or turn a blind eye? And having the ability to be creative, yes. focus on problem solving, and make art, not money, art, not corporate policy, art, artistry in your craftsmanship and how you create rapport and relationships with people. Let art, not policy, have the last word as we go about our day and love on other people. And if you make art, whether it's art, physical art, or beauty, or craftsmanship in a thank you note, or craftsmanship in an email that's drafted a certain way, or craftsmanship in the way that you handle a stressed out employee or a customer that's looking to cancel an order or, or escalate something. If you make that your art, you will be indispensable and you will never have to worry about losing your job or, uh, or being replaced by technology. If you don't do those things, if all you do is something that can be replaced by a computer, 
you better learn how to write chat GPT <laughs> prompts and become a copywriter with, with technology and uh, machine learning because if what you do is replaceable with technology, it, it will be replaced. So don't let it happen to you. <laughs> make art. Make art. That's make the antidote. Make art. Prob project completers are yep. problem, problem solvers. Problem solvers and communicators <laughs> cannot be replaced That's by right. AI. Well, good night, everybody, and good day, whatever day of time, whatever time of day this is that you're listening to this. We are so if you're on the treadmill, yeah, you've been on it a dude, while. Keep running. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> keep going. But whatever the completion of your current project is, we encourage you to write it in the comments. Tell us what you're working on. We want to hear about it, and we want to be able to respond and let you guys know that we uh, we are all for you finishing and completing the current project that you're in. We know you can do it, and we know that as you have fun and educate your children in becoming project completers and problem solvers, that you will not have a problem at all with their ambition as they grow That's older. That's right. Thanks for so being with night. us. good night. Thanks for tuning in, liking, and subscribing. Love you guys. Have a great night. Have a great night.